Welcome to the 2014 public meeting of the Canada Pension Plan Investment Board, or CPPIB for short. I'm Linda Sims, Director of Media Relations at CPPIB. Today we're broadcasting from Toronto to bring together Canadians simultaneously from coast to coast in nine cities across Canada and on our web. are unable to travel or take time off work to attend in person. Welcome to all of you who are watching from one of our locations or watching us via our webcast at cppib.com. We hold these public meetings every two years in each of the nine provinces that participate in the CPP. They give us an opportunity to speak directly to Canadians about how we're managing the CPP fund, and they allow you to ask questions about CPPIB. Here with me today in Toronto are Bob Astley, Chair of the Board of Directors at CPPIB, and our President and CEO, Mark Wiseman. Bob and Mark will provide background on our organization and an update on our recent activities. Following the presentation, we'll have time for questions, which you can direct to Bob or Mark. Now you can do this by speaking directly to the CPPIB representative at your location, filling out a question card and handing it to them. Or if you are joining us by the web, you can simply type your question in the comment box on the screen. I'll now hand over to Bob so we can get started. Bob? Thank you, Linda. Hello and welcome everyone. We are holding this public meeting following another successful fiscal year for CPPIB. At our last public meeting in June 2012, we reported the CPP fund had just exceeded $160 billion. Today we are pleased to report the CPP fund ended its most recent fiscal year on March 31, 2014 with net assets of $219.1 billion an all-time high, and a $57 billion increase since our last public meeting. To start today's meeting, I will walk through the history of the CPP and CPPIB to provide context for why we are here today. The CPP is a universal savings program with compulsory contributions by all workers and employees in Canada, excluding Quebec, which, ha which has its own pension plan. Upon retirement, Canadians receive benefits directly proportional to the contributions they made. When the CPP was created in 1966, there were 6.5 workers for every retiree. However, by the 1990s, projections showed that by 2055, there would be only two workers per retiree. By 1996, the benefits paid out of the CPP some $17 billion, were substantially higher than the contributions coming into it, $11 billion. At the time, the Chief Actuary of Canada, an independent unit within the federal government's Office of the Superintendent of Financial Institutions, projected that the CPP's assets, which then amounted to $35 billion, would be depleted by 2015. So, in 1997, Canada's provincial and federal governments came together to create bold reforms to address these demographic changes and to ensure the CPP would be there for generations to come. They took two steps. They increased the contribution rates and they created the Canada Pension Plan Investment Board to invest the assets of the CPP not currently needed to pay benefits. This action was truly a remarkable political achievement. Very few other countries have succeeded in putting their national pension plans on a sound footing. CPPIB was specifically designed to be governed and managed independently of the CPP and at arm's length from government. <coughs> the CPPIB Act that established CPPIB gave it a clear investment-only mandate to maximize returns of the CPP fund without undue risk of loss. 
This means CPPIB is focused only on the creation of financial value and not on politics, regional, social, or economic development considerations, nor any other non-investment objectives. The CPP fund assets belong to the 18 million contributors and beneficiaries who participate in the CPP. And with that in mind, unlike many other national pension plans, CPPIB management reports to an independent professional board of directors, not to government. A principal duty of the board is to provide oversight to CPPIB's investment strategy and programs, which are increasingly complex, sophisticated, and global in nature. And as it carries out its mandate, CPPIB remains accountable to Canadians including by requiring employees to follow a code of conduct outlining the behavior expected of them to act in the best interests of CPP contributors and beneficiaries, disclosing quarterly and annual financial results, announcing ongoing investment transactions, providing regular and timely information on its website and other methods as you see on the screen. We also meet on an ongoing basis with provincial and federal Ministry of Finance officials. I encourage you to visit cppib.com to explore the depth of information of available about CPPIB's investments, performance, leadership, and each of CPPIB's investment departments and investment teams. CPPIB's governance model that combines independence and accountability has been recognized as a best practice for national pension plans by the World Bank, International Monetary Fund, and OECD, amongst others, and was designed to help ensure that the CPP is there for Canadians when they retire. And since the reforms to the CPP and the creation of the CPPIB, the health of the CPP has dramatically improved. Today, the CPP fund is on solid financial footing. In December 2013, the chief actuary reaffirmed that the CPP now remains sustainable at the current contribution rate of 9.9% for the next 75 years. While this turnaround in the financial health of the CPP fund can be attributed to both contribution reforms and the creation of CPPIB. CPPIB has added more than $110 billion in cumulative investment income since it was created. CPPIB's 10-year annualized 5.1% real rate of return is comfortably above the 4% net real return the chief actuary assumes in assessing sustainability of the CPP. At almost $220 billion, the CPP fund is the largest single-purpose pool of capital in Canada and one of the 10 largest retirement funds in the world today. By 2030, the fund is expected to grow to over half a trillion dollars. The CPPIB mandate to maximum returns of the CPP fund is inherently long-term and means CPPIB must have an investment strategy designed to focus on achieving long-term stable returns over decades, not quarters or years. Before I turn over the floor to Mark Wiseman to go further into how CPPIB ex executes on this mandate, as this year marks the close of my tenure as a director of CPPIB, I want to thank my fellow directors for the privilege of serving alongside them for the past eight years. I'm deeply conscious of the chair's responsibility to 18 million contributors and beneficiaries of the CPP, and it has been an honor to have made a contribution to its stewardship. Mark, over to you. Before I begin, Bob, let me say a few words in recognition of your service to CPPIB. Bob has overseen CPPIB through a tremendous period of growth, 
and his leadership has left an enduring legacy. I also want to thank him personally for his mentorship during my first two years as Chief Executive Officer. As one of the 18 million contributors and beneficiaries to the Canada Pension Plan, on behalf of all of us, Bob, thank you. Today is my first public meeting as CEO, and I'm excited to address Canadians coast to coast to discuss how CPPIB serves you as contributors and beneficiaries of the Canada Pension Plan. And I'm looking forward to taking your questions. Today, CPPIB is truly one of Canada's leading global investors. With nearly $220 billion in assets, the CPP fund is one of the largest retirement funds in the world today and is growing. And as Bob said, the chief actuary's current projections show that the Canada Pension Plan is sustainable and will be there for you when you retire. With the current unstable state of many national pension plans around the world, as Canadians, I believe that we can be proud of the Canada Pension Plan's strong footing. Today, I will share with you more detail about CPPIB's approach to managing a pool of capital of this size. First, I will highlight what makes us a unique investor in an extremely competitive global market. Next, I'll present our performance. And finally, I'll discuss our investment strategy to fulfill our long-term mandate to Canadians. CPPIB's investment strategy is designed to leverage the comparative advantages that were built into our structure when CPPIB was created. First, a large and growing CPP fund is a significant benefit that enables CPPIB to participate in the world's largest transactions and to shape investments, not just respond to them. For example, CPPIB has participated in some of the world's largest private equity transactions. Second, the certainty of assets coming into the CPP fund. The recent Chief Actuary's report found that for about the next decade, no investment income will be needed to help pay pensions. Rather, Canada Pension Plan contributions will provide CPPIB incoming cash for new investments. This fact alone makes CPP unique from almost every other pension fund in Canada. Because of this certainty of assets, we are able to be a flexible, patient investor, and CPPIB can take advantage of opportunities in volatile markets when others must often sell their assets in the face of their short-term liabilities. Finally, with our long-term mandate, we're not in, under any pressure to achieve short-term results. Rather, we can retain a steadfast and unwavering focus on achieving long-term stable returns over decades, not fiscal quarters. The ability to retain a long-term focus is a significant advantage in a market where many other investors are sidetracked by short-term performance pressures. Ultimately, fully leveraging these unique advantages to compete around the world for the best investments and to effectively manage a $220 billion portfolio and structure multi-billion dollar transactions relies on the thousand people who make up the Canada Pension Plan Investment Board. CPPIB recruits top talent globally and we pay the competitive salaries needed to attract and retain sophisticated investment professionals. We compensate our professionals with long-term incentive plans, which means they are judged on the performance of the Canada Pension Plan Fund over several years, not the performance in any given year or quarter. In short, they are aligned in interest with all of us. Yet, beyond financial performance, our employees are driven by our unique purpose. This year, for example, all CPPIB employees globally participated in sessions that looked at how we incorporate our guiding principles of integrity, partnership, and high performance in our day-to-day -day work. These sessions affirmed for me the sense of dedication our employees have, no matter where they're located in the world. They have this dedication to the 18 million contributors and beneficiaries that they work on behalf of. 
My colleagues on CPPIB's senior management team, shown here on the screen, are in person, coast to coast today, meeting with Canadians. Now, let's look at how we've done translating these comparative advantages into the performance needed to sustain the Canada Pension Plan. During fiscal 2014, the CPP fund crossed the $200 billion mark for the first time and grew by some $35.8 billion to end the year at $219.1 billion. This increase marks the fund's largest annual gain to date and consisted of $30.1 billion in net investment income generated by CPPIB after its operating costs and some $5.7 billion in net CPP contributions. During fiscal 2014, we also completed some 45 transactions of over $200 million each in 11 different countries around the world, including in the United States, Australia, the United Kingdom, Brazil, India, Peru, France, China, South Korea, and of course, here at home in Canada. The depth of our global capabilities was evident in the valuable assets that we added to our investment portfolio this year. These included acquiring a significant stake in Allianz Shopping Centers, one of Brazil's top real estate companies. Our first real estate deal in India, an alliance and initial commitment of US $200 million with the Sharpurji Palanji Group to acquire office properties in major Indian cities. And alongside other investment partners, the US $6 billion acquisition of Neiman Marcus Group, a leading luxury retailer with a global brand recognition. All of this activity resulted in the portfolio delivering a gross investment return of 16.5% for fiscal 2014. However, more important than our performance in any given year is our performance over the longer term horizon for which we invest. Ultimately, the Canada Pension Plan Investment Board is focused on creating long term value to help sustain the CPP. Our objective is to maximize returns without taking excessive risk. Since inception, CPPIB has contributed more than $110 billion in cumulative investment income, meaning that over half of the fund's assets are the direct result of CPPIB's investment activities. The fund's five-year annualized return for the, is 11.7%, and the 10-year annualized return for the fund is 7.1%. I'll note that this period includes the global financial crisis of 2008-2009. CPPIB will continue to have a steadfast approach to investing for the long term through individual market cycles. Our results are encouraging indicators of our long term performance. In particular, we are pleased that our 10 year return exceeds the chief actuary's 4% return assumption, and we remain confident that our strategy will generate the returns needed to help sustain the Canada Pension Plan over longer periods of time. As I mentioned earlier, CPPIB's ability to retain a focus on our long-term results is a comparative advantage in a market where many other investors are preoccupied by short-term pressures. I want to highlight for a moment why this is the case. As the past 10 years have demonstrated, in any given year, our performance can vary drastically. Over this time period, many other investors have had to sell their investments at inopportune times to meet their short-term liabilities, or they need to bow to short-term liquidity or performance pressures. On the other hand, CPPIB's extremely long investment horizon means that we expect and are structured to withstand periods where we may experience substantial short-term losses. We are in the business of taking on calculated risk. We do so to generate long-term value that we believe will exceed any short-term downside over the long run. What matters most is our ability to provide the long-term returns required to sustain the Canada Pension Plan. In doing so, we cannot be sidetracked by short-term volatility. We must stay the course on investments when others simply cannot. We must quickly react to opportunities to buy or sell assets for significant value when such opportunities arise 
and retain our focus on maximizing long-term performance of the CPP fund. So, during the remainder of my remarks today, I will focus on four crucial dimensions of CPPIB's long-term investment strategy to maximize the value of the CPP fund. First, we continue to build a diversified portfolio of assets designed to provide strong returns through market cycles over the long horizon for which we invest. CPPIB invests globally across a wide range of asset classes, including public equities, private equities, bonds, private debt, real estate, and infrastructure, to name a few. Over the longer term, we expect our private assets, including things like real estate, infrastructure, private equity, and private debt, to contribute significant value to the CPP fund. Today, these private assets comprise over 40% of the fund, and they generated $17.8 billion in realized and unrealized gains in our latest fiscal year. Next, to help ensure the sustainability of the Canada Pension Plan for decades to come, CPPIB pursues a global investment strategy. The centers of economic and demographic power are shifting. By 2025, for example, it is expected that India, Brazil, China, Indonesia, and South Korea will be responsible for over half of all global economic growth. Over the next two decades, China alone is expected to overtake the United States as the world's largest economy. To reduce an over-reliance on Canada's relatively small capital markets and our relatively small domestic economy, CPPIB must continue to diversify risk internationally and harness the power of positive global growth for the benefit of Canadians here at home. Today, Canadian workers and beneficiaries through the CPPIB own assets all over the globe, including shopping centers in Brazil, office towers in New York City, shipping and distribution hubs in Asia, and toll roads in Chile, and many more. As we continue to build this portfolio globally, we integrate the consideration of environmental, social, and governance factors, or ESG factors, into our investment decisions. And we have an in-house team to support our investment teams in this endeavor. We do this because we fundamentally believe that over the exceptionally long horizon for which we invest, these environmental, social, and governance factors have the potential to be significant drivers or barriers to profitability. Our investment-only mandate means we do not eliminate or screen investments based on ESG factors alone. Rather, we integrate ESG factors into a host of considerations that guide our investment decisions with the goal to maximize the long-term value of the CPP fund. As an owner, we believe we can be a powerful influence in the companies in which we invest. Instead of simply selling our investments when ESG-related issues arise, or as I like to say, instead of voting with our feet, we prefer to engage with companies to seek changes we would like to see. There are many different types of capital providers in the world today. Ultimately, we believe stakeholders, society, and the environment are better off with the type of engaged capital that CPPIB represents. I invite you to visit our website at www.cppib.com to see our yearly report on responsible investing and to get more details on our approach in this regard. And finally, CPPIB's investment horizon allows us to take a long-term approach to building our organization. In fiscal 2014, senior management, along with our board of directors, completed an in-depth examination of how we believe CPPIB must operate beyond the most immediate fiscal years to ensure that we are well positioned to take the right actions today that are in the best interest of the CPP fund for decades to come. As we seek out the best investment opportunities around the world, we must invest in the sophisticated systems, processes, and structures that are necessary to succeed in a highly competitive global market. We're doing precisely that today and will continue to do so for years to come. One key element of this is building a strong presence in global markets 
where we believe growth is going to exceed the global average over the long term. In addition to our headquarters here in Toronto and our existing international offices in London and Hong Kong, this fiscal year we opened offices in New York and Sao Paulo, Brazil. Expertise in these international locations provides CPPIB with rich and deep insights, connections and access to investment opportunities that would simply not be available if we did not have a local presence. Importantly, we are also in the business of managing our assets in our growing portfolio. And proximity to our investments provides CPPIB with better oversight capabilities and allows our priorities to be on not just investing, but also risk management. Over the coming fiscal year, our priorities, which you can see on the screen, and for the years that will follow, will ensure that CPPIB steadily delivers on our mandate and maximizes the value of the CPP fund. In closing, I want to thank all of CPPIB's employees for their ongoing dedication this year to building the foundation for Canadians' financial security and retirement. Linda, back to you. Thanks, Mark. Now for the question and answer period. Many of you have already submitted questions either through our website or at the meeting that you're attending, and we will begin with those. But you can continue to send in questions for either Bob Astley, Chair of the Board, or Mark Wiseman, our Chief Executive Officer. Just to remind you, for those of you attending this meeting in person at one of our public meeting locations, you can submit a question by filling out a question card and handing it to the CPPIB representative at your location. They will submit your question to us here in the Toronto studio. If you're joining us via the web, you can simply type your question into the comment box. And we're going to try to cover as many questions as we can today, but due to time constraints, it may not be possible to answer all the questions that we receive. Any that we can't get to today, we will answer in writing following the meeting as long as you've provided your contact information along with your question. So let's get started. Mark, I'm going to start with you. You were talking in your presentation about um, the ESG, environmental, social, and governance issues that we take into consideration. We had um, Tom, who's watching this via webcast uh, from Sydney, Nova Scotia, write in. Uh, he'd like to know a bit more. He asks, what are CPPIB's ESG factors? What level of priority does CPPIB place on these factors? when it's deciding these investments. And then he also asks, would detrimental ESG factors veto an investment option even if the financial return was high? Well, thanks, uh, thanks Tom, for that question. Thank you, Linda, for, for relaying it. Um, the way that we look at environmental, social, and governance factors at CPPIB is not from a policy perspective. We look at these factors in terms of how they will affect the long-term uh, return on a, uh, on a specific investment. Now we think as a long-term investor that environmental, social and governance factors are very important for us to consider. And in fact, we have a team uh, embedded within our public market investments group that specifically assess, uh, assists our investment professionals uh, in better assessing environment, social, environmental, social and governance factors in making our uh, investment decisions. These factors are weighed uh, and they go into uh, a multiple of things that we look at, all of the risks, in fact, in making any individual investment decision. So while we don't screen investments, these factors do go in to our decision making when we make a specific investment. At times, uh, these factors are so worrisome to us that we think that in the long run, we're better not to invest in a specific company. But again, it's if those factors are so concerning to us, uh, relative to the price we're going to pay for the investment and what we believe the long-term value of that assessment of that investment will be. Um, again, it's not a policy perspective, it's an investment perspective. So we won't screen things out of the box, um, but those factors do go into our judgment of long-term value. We think that makes us a better investment. And I should point out, we have a report on responsible investing that we post each fall um, on our website that goes into some detail uh, about how we make these decisions, and I encourage you to uh, to read them at www.cppib.com. 
Great, thanks, Mark. Um, Bob, I've got a question for you. Tony is watching us from uh, Winnipeg on the mm -hmm. webcast, and he said, uh, please describe CPPIB's long-term plans regarding bonus and incentive payments to officers and employees of the board. Well, first of all, Tony, Winnipeg is my hometown, so I'm pleased to respond to your question. The first point I would make is that compensation is one of the very important parts of our operation that the Board of Directors pays a great deal of attention to because it is an essential part of our strategy to be an active global investor. So while we're competing for investments, we're also competing for the best investment talent, quite literally, around the world. So the Board oversees our compensation programs from that perspective to look at the, uh, the programs that will make us competitive in, as we search for the best investment talent and for the administ administrative support that goes with it. Uh, in terms of the specifics of our uh, invest, uh, bon uh, bonuses and uh, other incentive programs, the Board places a great deal of emphasis on longer term pay for performance in our measures. So we've struck a balance and our principal measurement period is a four-year investment period focusing very very significantly on the value added by our investment teams and their supporting staff as well as the total fund rate of return. I will say that I think the Board of Directors through its Human Resources and Compensation Committee does a very good job in ensuring that the compensation programs are well aligned to our strategy, they're competitive in the marketplace, and they're operating within a reasonable cost. The total cost of operation of all of the thousand employees uh, 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 accumulates to less than 29 basis points of the total assets of the fund, and that's an important measure that the board follows. Thank you for the question, Tony. Now, Tony had asked about employees, but officers as well, presumably, meaning um, how the board compensation is determined. The, uh, when I, I speak about the employees, I'm, I'm talking about the senior management and uh, all of the employees that work for CPPIB. Uh, the directors are paid a fixed fee. It's not performance-based, and we uh, calibrate their compensation with regard to other uh, similar investment organizations, pension funds in Canada uh, principally. And so that's our basis for a comparison for the directors. Great. Thanks, Bob. Uh, Mark, back to you. We have a question that's come in from uh, Winnipeg. Uh, it's about a specific asset, but I think it can be broadened because it, it really talks about how we deal with uh, w w when we buy a public company and we take it private. The question is, how is the valuation determined without the benefit of watching the stock prices go up and down? So presumably once it's private. Well, um, first of all, let me, let me say that um, we buy both public companies and, and private companies or, or interests therein. Um, and whenever we're buying a company, whether it be a public company or a private company, um, we're not just taking uh, a price that's, that's given to us. Um, in every case, we are doing our own assessment, we are doing our own evaluation um, and our own diligence to determine uh, what we believe the intrinsic value uh, of that asset is. And so, for example, when it is a, uh, when it is a, a private asset, um, whether it be a building, an infrastructure asset, um, whether it be a, an operating company, uh, in each case what we are doing is we are doing detailed assessments, uh, what we call due diligence, in terms of looking at the underlying value drivers of the company. We may assess the quality of management, uh, the quality of uh, the product, as we spoke about earlier, um, the environmental, social, and governance implications of the way that that asset uh, operates, again, regardless of what type of an asset it is. Um, obviously, when we're buying a public company, um, we tend to have to rely on publicly available information um, to make that assessment. So in many respects, when we're buying a private company, we actually have more information um, than we would uh, in a public company context. Once we own an asset, obviously the value of that asset is determined on an annual basis um, uh, by evaluation committee internally. 
Um, that valuation is then tested by our auditors who are independent of management. Um, and indeed, that is reviewed by our audit committee of the board of, of directors. And that's how we arrive at the overall assets of the fund. If the asset is a publicly quoted asset, then it's easy to find out what the value is at the end of the year uh, or at the end of each quarter. If it's a private asset, um, we would look at things like metrics, other uh, comparable companies, and seeing how those, what those companies have been priced at either in the public markets or through a private transaction that we're aware of. Again, all of that is vetted by uh, our auditors um, as part of their process at the end of each year and at the end of each quarter. Great. Thanks, Mark. Sure uh, yeah. I might just add to that, just to support what Mark has said, that the audit committee of the board pays particular attention to the valuation of private assets to ensure consistency from year to year and to ensure that the valuations are reasonable given all of the factors that Mark has mentioned. So this is one of the principal functions of the audit committee is to make sure that those private assets are valued fairly and consistently over time so that all of our stakeholders can rely on those values as being truly representative of the value of the organizations we invest in. Good. Good. Thanks for that, Bob. Um, I've got a question that's come from Adam, who's uh, watching us by uh, webcast from Edmonton. Um, maybe both of you will have something to say, but I'll start with you, Bob. Um, is CPPIB considering what the impact of an expanded CPP would look like and, and what it would do to its long-term projections? So again, we, we won't comment on whether or not this might happen, but how could it affect and are, are, would we be ready for an expansion? Well, the first thing that I would say is that uh, the CPPIB takes no policy position on whether changes to or expansion of the Canada Pension Plan uh, are, is a good idea. That's for Canadians and the political leaders that we have in the provinces and in the federal government to decide. But it is our responsibility to invest the funds that the CPP generates over time. And that's where I think Mark can, in fact, say quite a lot about the investigations we have done and the impact that that might have on the fund. Mark? Th thanks, Bob. W what I would say um, to, to this question is that as an organization, you saw the slide in the presentation earlier, uh, we are built for scale. And so um, we are set up uh, to be able to manage an increasingly large reserve fund. That reserve fund is going to get bigger regardless of whether or not there is reform to the CPP. So as Bob said, uh, we are uh, not taking a position, and nor should we take a position, on whether or not there should be re reform of the Canada Pension Plan. Should policymakers, however, uh, determine that they wish to expand the CPP, we are well positioned, uh, we believe, uh, to invest that money over the long term. That will take some time uh, to come about. And we believe that our current investment strategy um, would place us in a very good position um, to be able to manage any increased inflows that would come from a potential increase in the, uh, in the CPP. One of the things that's quite interesting um, is that um, we um, have set ourselves up in such a way that we can invest uh, monies very, very quickly. Of course, we're getting monies in all the time from the operation of the Canada Pension Plan. And what we do is when those monies come in, um, we invest them passively into either bond indices or equity indices until such time as we find uh, good active management, good active investments uh, to, uh, to put the money towards. So it's not just sitting under the mattress or sitting in cash. Uh, we are invested each and every day, and we have a unique ability to invest that capital in the markets through our global capital markets team uh, until such time as we find what we call an active investment or something alternative um, to the equity indices or the bond indices um, to invest the monies in. Okay, thanks, Mark. Uh, I'm going to stay with you. Uh, Jane Brett from Victoria has sent in another um, essentially ESG uh, question. Um, she says, fumes from coal-fired power plants kill 25,000 a year in China. Growth relying on fossil fuels are increasing CO2 levels worldwide. Looking at long-term volatility, should CPPIB not reduce investment in oil, gas, coal, and mining? Well, Jane, thank you for that question. Um, as, um, as I said earlier, um, we do look at environmental, social, and governance uh, factors 
uh, when we make investments. And we tend not to um, look at those factors uh, overall. I'm going to come back to that in just a second. Uh, but we tend to look at those factors on an investment by investment basis. Um, so what we are looking at is an individual company or an individual asset that we invest in, what is the long-term value of that asset? So for example, uh, a company that did a better job uh, relative to others in terms of sequestering, let's say, carbon emissions, um, we would value that asset because we're a long-term investor uh, more highly and be more likely to invest in that asset than an, invest than an asset or a company that did a poor job in terms of sequestering um, its emissions. If we were a short-term investor, we might not care about these things because the market in the next few days, few weeks, uh, even few months or few years um, is unlikely to take account for these things. But as a long-term investor, we look at it quite a bit differently. We put more weight um, on those environmental factors than a shorter-term investor would. Now, the other thing that we do do is look long-term at the portfolio overall. And one of the things that we look at is our exposures as a total fund um, to various factors like oil price, um, um, like demographic uh, shifts, um, like changes in currency. And one of the things that we are increasingly looking at in this thematic area um, are things like environmental impact. And what is that environmental impact going to have overall um, on the portfolio? And we're spending increasing amounts of time um, thinking about those issues both uh, in terms of individual countries, um, but also general uh, assets and general types of investments. And uh, it's an area that we're spending increasing amounts of time thinking about uh, as a thematic theme, uh, as a thematic idea, as a thematic factor in our investment decisions, um, as opposed to just at the individual asset level. All right. Thanks for that, Mark. Um, we have a, a question that's come in from Blair in Charlottetown. He's watching us by webcast. Um, and uh, Bob, maybe you can help with this. He says, I understand that the adjustment factor, the Canada Pension Plan payments for early or late drawings, is based on the target rate of return for CPP investments. You indicated that this target rate is 4%. How is this rate determined? Uh, that rate of 4% real, that's 4% after inflation is taken into account, is set by the chief actuary by looking at the types of investments that he expects the CPP fund to make over the long term and the long term rates of return that, that can be achieved on those investments. So, for example, there's a, a concept called an equity risk premium that is earned by investors in the stock market over very long periods of time in excess of the rate of return that could be invested, that could be earned by investing in risk-free assets. So that's one component and it's given uh, a significant weight in the portfolio. The chief actuary assigns uh, different rates of return to other assets in the, in the portfolio such as bond investments in Canada, uh, international bonds weights all of those together and comes up with the 4% return that the chief actuary anticipates uh, will be earned on, uh, on by the portfolio without taking into account any excess returns that Mark and his management team may earn over time by applying their skill to the investments that we have in our portfolio. So that's the way the 4% real return assumption is is derived and, uh, as you point out, is used in the calculation of early retirement benefits. Well, one thing I might add to that, Bob, and I think it's, it's interesting for Canadians to be aware of, that um, as important as the investment returns of CPPIBR to the CPP Reserve Fund and to the uh, long-term health of the Canada Pension Plan um, over time, the other factors are actually uh, even more important in the Chief Actuary's report. And again, you can go online and get the Chief Actuary's uh, report, which he uh, uh, just last updated at December 31st of uh, 2013. Um, but what's interesting as you read through that report is that you'll see that the factors that will really have an impact on the potential sustainability of the plan in the long run, um, much more so than investment returns, are the demographic factors, the very makeup of Canada. Uh, what are fertility rates going to be like in this country for the next 75 years? What will immigration rates uh, be in this country? What will workforce 
participation be, and of course, importantly, uh, what, what will uh, life expectancy be uh, in the country uh, over the years to come. And the chief actuary provides a number of sensitivities uh, around those assumptions. So when you take all of that together and then add in uh, the 4% real rate of return uh, prospectively that the chief actuary assumes, uh, that's how he comes to his conclusion uh, that the plan is indeed sustainable uh, for the next 75 years. Mark, I'm going to follow up on this because uh, Bev has written into us. She's watching us by webcast from Regina, um, and, and it's, I think got a little frustration at, at how much she's getting maybe in CPP benefits. She says the post-retirement benefit program doesn't seem to be providing much value to CPP recipients. What is the strategy for this program? Will Canadians ever actually benefit from it? So I think she's wondering in part about how CPPIB, as you mentioned, not the most important element, but how we are helping to secure those retirement security? Well, what I will say is that um, the CPPIB is the asset manager for the reserve fund. That is our sole purpose. Um, the Canada Pension Plan is a, uh, is a federal uh, government uh, administered plan. Uh, it is supported by the nine participating provinces, the nine provinces um, excluding Quebec, and uh, the plan is administered under a joint federal and provincial uh, jurisdiction. Um, the sufficiency of that plan, that's a question of public policy. Um, whether it should be larger, should be smaller, should exist at all, um, is ultimately, and thankfully from my perspective, uh, a question left to policymakers and, and politicians. Um, our job at the CPPIB is to manage the assets of the Reserve Fund, and as our act states, to maximize return um, without undue risk of loss. And day in and day out, um, that's what I and my thousand colleagues at CPPIB are trying to do, to manage that fund um, in order to maximize return on a risk-adjusted basis such that we can do our part, such that the reserve fund can do its part in terms of providing um, that financial um, security. And I will say um, we're quite proud of what we've accomplished to date, and there's always more work to do. But of the $219 billion uh, in the Reserve Fund today, um, since uh, our inception in 1997, $110 billion, or just slightly over 50%, has actually come uh, from investment returns. And that's helped support um, the long-term sustainability of the Canada Pension Plan. Great. Right. Thanks, Mark. Um, you were talking about uh, you and your team uh, at, at hard at work. And uh, another question from Blair from Charlottetown, and maybe, Bob, you can help us with this. He's asking, how are members of the CPPIB chosen, and what are typical qualifications? I assume that we're referring to members of the board of directors. Um, he didn't say, but let's start with the board, and then sure. perhaps Mark can talk to us about the investment professionals. Indeed. The, the composition and choice of the 12 members of the board of CPPIB is a very interesting one. I will say that all of those 12 individuals are totally independent of governments in, in Ottawa or in any of the provinces, uh, but uh, they are appointed by the federal government after having consulted with the provinces, the, the nine participating provinces. Uh, the CPPIB board does have an important role because we manage the process of identifying what skills and competencies we need for the next recruit to the board, the next addition to the board, bearing in mind the, uh, the skills and, and experiences that we already have on the board. But we uh, hire the search firm, we interview prospective candidates, we make recommendations through the CPPIB nominating committee, which then vets those, ensures that we have, have done a thorough job in terms of identifying the right people, and then if they are satisfied with those, uh, those particular recommendations, forwards them on to the Federal Minister of Finance, who then consults with his uh, provincial counterparts. Once appointed to the board of CPPIB, any one of those 12 directors is solely responsible for uh, overseeing the CPP Investment Board according to the Act, and we're totally politically impartial in that process. I will say, too, that having sat around the board table for eight years, 
all of those directors are incredibly committed to the purpose uh, at hand, which is to uh, guide and oversee the operations of CPPIB uh, and supervising an outstanding management team. Mark, I'll, I'll leave it to you to speak about the employees. Well, of course, one of the things that the, the board does that I think is important anyway is appoint the, uh, right, right. the <laughs> chief executive officer and, and, and president of the, uh, of the fund. And then, um, and then it becomes the role of the management team to, to build an effective uh, global investment team. Um, we actually have within our human resources department a uh, growing uh, talent acquisition team um, who is responsible for helping us bring on um, the highest quality employees around the world. And of course we have five offices around the world today, uh, including our head office in Toronto, uh, plus London, Hong Kong, Sao Paulo, and, uh, and New York. In each case, when we're looking to hire um, an employee, whether they be an investment professional, uh, somebody assisting us in what we call core services, which are in areas like finance, accounting, uh, legal, um, IT, etc. We are looking for the very best and brightest um, to help uh, allow us to be the most successful organization that we can be. Um, we do that um, by a series of interviews, uh, typically. Um, and for most people, before they get a job at CPPIB, they've, they've probably met um, at least a half dozen, in many cases a dozen or more people within the team uh, before they're given uh, an offer of employment. In fact, I recently heard um, that last month alone um, we had 1,700 people uh, visit the CPPIB uh, employment page. And we are today um, lucky enough to be an organization who has a brand and has a reputation, not just in Canada, um, but globally, uh, where people want to come work for us. And we believe we have our choice of some of the best people around the world um, to come and join uh, our firm. Maybe we can follow up on what you were talking about being a global investor because we get asked quite often um, how are we ensuring that when we off, off, open an office such as the recent one in Sao Paulo or in Hong Kong, how are we ensuring that CPPIB does add value to, to the fund? Well, one of the things we're looking at, remember everything that we report, all of the returns that we um, report, um, that is net of our costs. And as Bob mentioned earlier, last year that was about 29 uh, basis points, or in other words, 0.29% of the assets uh, of the fund um, went to the operations and management, the cost of operations and management of, of the, the CPPIB. So whenever we are um, looking to open an office, um, it really is a decision. Do we believe that that office, that new office, will over the long run, uh, and long run is important here, um, be able to add to the risk-adjusted returns on a net basis uh, of the fund overall. And when we look at risk-adjusted returns, um, we don't look at the cost of the office, but we also look at the benefit uh, of the office. And those benefits aren't just in terms of sourcing uh, new uh, investment opportunities. Uh, a very important thing about our global offices is they're actually managing risk. And we think risk management is an incredibly important part uh, of what we do at CPPIB. And when I say risk management, it means we think it's useful uh, to be close to our investments. Uh, we think it's useful to have local knowledge. We think it's useful to be monitoring um, our partners uh, around the world. And so once we have a certain degree of critical mass in a region, um, we may choose um, to open an office um, to help manage our investments and to help manage and uh, our risk uh, in the region. So for example, just take Sao Paulo. Uh, in Sao Paulo, um, we didn't open the office until we had in excess of five billion dollars uh, invested in Latin America. And we have a very specific focus on Brazil, Chile, Peru, Colombia, and Mexico uh, in that region. And one of the important roles of our office in Sao Paulo is to ensure that we are uh, in the region uh, that we have feet on the ground, um, we know who's doing what to whom, and importantly, uh, we're managing those five billion dollars worth of investments um, that we already have. Great, thanks, Mark. Um, Bob, I wanted to uh, bring a question to you that uh, that comes into our CPPIB mailbox, and that is, how does CPPIB ensure ensure that it maintains its independence from government? You mentioned that recently, but how do you do that while ensuring that you keep the governments who oversee CPPIB informed on its activities? 
I'm going to go back a little bit into history again. I, I spoke a little bit about the historical context in my opening remarks and described the creation of CPPIB and the reforms to CPP in 1997 as a remarkable political achievement. Part of the reason I say that is that the policy makers at the time took a very, very wise move. They wrote into the governing legislation of the, that controls the CPPIB, that legislation is the CPPIB Act, that it shall, shall be independent of government because they heard from Canadians at the time that Canadians really wanted that to be a sure thing. They did not want their, their dollars to be invested according to political priorities. So the political leaders at the time, back in the mid-1990s, heard that, they acted on it, and they enshrined it in legislation. So that is very much a part of the mandate of the board of directors, of Mark, of his entire management team, and all of the employees that work for CPPIB. We reinforce that in many different ways, but the principal way is that it's written directly into our code of conduct, that we shall act in a politically impartial manner, and that if there is ever any attempt to influence us in our choice of investments or our, our other activities from the political level, it shall be immediately communicated to uh, the responsible people within the organization. Uh, I'm, I'm very pleased to be able to say, as we have in the past, that there have never been any instances of attempt, attempted political direction to CPPIB, indicating, I think, that the wisdom of that initial policy position in 1997 has been understood and very well accepted by political leaders throughout Canada at the, at the federal level and at the provincial level. Good. Thanks, Bob. Uh, Mark, we're going to uh, circle back to a question that had uh, come in from John uh, in, in Winnipeg. Um, uh, he was asking about a, an asset that we had taken private. Um, we talked generally. He would like to ask you about the specific asset, and that's KCI, Kinetic Concepts, Inc. Uh, it was formerly listed, of course, on the NYSE, the New York Stock Exchange, taken private uh, with us and APAC. So his question was, that the present state evaluation, how is it determined since you don't have that stock price? Yeah. So thanks, thanks, Linda, and, and thanks, uh, uh, John. John, John yeah. was it in uh, in Winnipeg? So again, uh, just to use that specific uh, specific example. So um, you know, KCI, which is, um, if I'm not mistaken, in, in the business of uh, uh, it's in the medical medical field, making uh, medical equipment and uh, uh, wound treatment. Yeah. Um, they. Um, what we would do is um, we would look at similar companies, companies that uh, make products that are similar or are in similar markets, um, and we would compare it, the value of those companies to uh, the private company. So we would look first of all, uh, our investment teams would look first of all, um, to public market comparables. So what are public market companies that do have a quoted price that are similar uh, to KCI? Um, we would look at multiples of things like uh, earnings. We would look at um, recent transactions if there was companies like that had been bought and sold um, in the in the market. And we would look at the amount of debt that KCI might have uh, compared um, to other similarly placed companies. We would all do all of that and come up with a range of valuation possibilities. Um, those range ranges of valuation possibilities would then be shared. Uh, uh, with an independent uh, valuation firm in most cases, um, and ultimately reviewed by our auditors, uh, Deloitte's, in terms of the preparation of the audited financial statements, and as Bob stated earlier, um, very closely overseen um, by our um, audit committee, which is a committee of our uh, board of directors. And so we do that on an asset by asset basis. And today, um, as you know, over 40% of the portfolio um, is private. So the fact that we have uh, an ability and a systematic way of valuing these companies um, is very important. Now, we don't do this any differently uh, than any other um, investment firm or any other company for that matter, because we follow uh, standardized valuation practices. 
um, and we follow uh, generally accepted accounting principles in terms of the way that we value um, these assets. And there's a set of rules that are set out um, that are quite prescriptive on how one ought to value these assets, whether they be public assets. You can think about a public company, which quote you use, because sometimes there's mul multiple quotes. Um, you can think about debt instruments. You can think about equity instruments. You can think about real assets. Each of them have a set of uh, guidelines and principles by which generally uh, GAAP or generally accepted accounting principles require that valuation to be done. And we follow those uh, principles um, to a T, and indeed we are required to do so. Great. Thanks, Mark. Um, next question is one that we get a lot, so I, I'm, I'm glad we're able to address it, and that is this. Your total costs keep rising both in dollar amount and as a percentage of assets. What are you doing to control costs? And I think both of you could comment on maybe, Mark, what you do in the organization and then the board oversight on this. Sure. Why don't I start, and sure. Bob, you can, you can follow up. Um, we take costs um, very seriously, and um, at the end of the day, uh, what is important is not, our, um, is not our gross returns, but in fact the net returns. What are the returns um, to the uh, CPP Reserve Fund after taking into account all of our costs? And we talk about maximizing return without undue risk of loss. That's our legislative imperative. Um, maximization of that return uh, is, has to be net of the costs of operating um, the CPPIB. And so in everything we do, we are cost conscious because ultimately uh, a dollar saved on the cost side is as good as a dollar earned um, on the investment side. So um, me as the CEO and all of our colleagues at CPPIB um, really think very, very carefully about how um, we spend your money. And ultimately we have to spend money uh, to earn money. Uh, we have to make, uh, uh, we have to invest in people, uh, in processes, in that due diligence looking and doing research on investments, um, and that comes with a uh, cost. But we try to be incredibly prudent in doing so and keeping that principle in mind all the time, um, that a dollar saved is as important um, as a dollar earned. Um, the other thing that I'll point out, and I'm sure that, that Bob will uh, elucidate on this a little bit, um, is that all of our um, compensation is based on the net return. So at the end of the day, um, our performance is measured after taking into account um, all of our costs. Now we're a very large organization and we invest around the world and that does come um, with a cost. We believe that those costs um, have led and will continue to lead um, to better investment returns for the fund uh, in the long run. Mark, I think the only point that I would add is that uh, when the board oversees the and approves the business plan that Mark and his colleagues prepare annually, that we think hard about the cost implications and about whether we're expecting to generate a longer term rate of return because we are investing in capabilities. For example, at opening the offices in, in uh, New York and Sao Paulo is a, a short-term cost, but as Mark indicated, very much a long-term investment that the board and the management clearly believe will, will pay benefits o over time. Uh, so that focus on, on cost is an important part uh, of our uh, decision-making process, and I'm quite comfortable that we're in the right ballpark. I might add one other feature uh, as I'm thinking about it as well. Uh, many organizations in other jurisdictions around the world uh, have outsourced a lot of their investment activities so that their costs of running the organization look low, but in fact they're paying extremely high fees to external investment managers. CPPIB has taken a very thoughtful approach in hiring external managers and has insourced many of that, the activities that we can do better and less expensively. And that shows up as a cost, but it's a real cost saving in the end for the investment results that we're obtaining. I think Canadians can be very confident that we're getting good value for the, for the dollars that are being spent by CPPIB. Thanks, Bob.
Uh, one more for you, uh, Mark, and this is Blair from Charlottetown who's written in with another question. He asks, what is the process on how investments are first identified for consideration for the fund? That and how big and, and what kind of a team do you have to support the CPPIB as decision makers in this process? Well, thanks, thanks Blair, for, for that question. Um, we have a number of teams, and each team uh, focuses on a specific uh, type of investment, a specific asset class. So, for example, we have a team that invests globally in infrastructure. Uh, we have a team that invests uh, globally in, uh, in, in, in certain types of, uh, of real estate. Um, we have another team um, that makes macro investment decisions. So long one market, one global market, let's say long the Japanese market, and maybe short, uh, meaning selling short uh, another market on a, on a global basis. In each, case is, in each case, that team is comprised of investment professionals who are expert uh, in that area. And in total, we have over 400 uh, investment professionals at the fund across all of these asset classes and across uh, the geographies uh, in which we uh, invest. Um, we are very strategic in what we do. So in each of those areas, we will have a specific strategy in terms of the types of investments that we are looking at at any uh, given time. So for example, um, our infrastructure team, just to take one example of, of any number of these teams, um, they are looking for assets of a certain scale and that have a certain type of characteristics. So for example, in infrastructure, again, they're looking for assets that are generally monopolistic in nature. Uh, these are assets where there isn't competition. You can think of something like a power line um, where there isn't two competing power lines. They're only investing in the, the single power line. And uh, looking at, uh, as a result of that, the re regulatory framework um, over which the government in which that, let's say, a power line um, runs um, is going to regulate that asset. And so they will assess, um, take all of that into account, the size of the investment, um, they'll be looking for the specific region uh, where they want to invest. They'll be looking at the regulatory uh, framework. And then they, before they make the ultimate investment decision, would actually go out and hire experts. For example, again, to follow on the power line example, um, they might hire engineers to look at the, uh, how well constructed um, the towers are or that line is um, before we make the investment. So again, each of our teams has specific investment criteria that they follow. Those investment criteria tie to a broader strategy that they've created for that individual asset class. And that strategy ultimately ties back to those comparative advantages. And we spend a lot of time thinking about it, those comparative advantages that we have as a fund um, overall. Ultimately, uh, when the team has decided to make an investment, it's not just them making the investment. That investment is vetted. Uh, by an investment committee, and ultimately for the largest of transactions that we, uh, we make, um, the investment uh, might even be vetted um, by our board of directors, or in fact the investment committee um, of our board of directors. Good. Thanks, Mark. Well, that's all the questions that we have today, so I'd like to thank both of you uh, for providing the answers. That's great. Uh, we do hope as well that this uh, today's presentation was informative for you and that it provided you with a good understanding of our work here at CPPIB and how we can help sustain Canada's pension promise for 18 million Canadians. Now, should you want to revisit the presentation anytime, you can do that. You can find it on our website. Again, our address is CPPIB. Dot com. That's the end of today's meeting. Thanks for joining us. Goodbye.